Welcome. Um, it's so nice to see such a nice turnout for tonight's event. Um, thank you for joining us here tonight. My name is Brooke Armstrong. I am a staff member at Arts and Ideas Sudbury School, uh, as the t-shirt says. Uh, our school first hosted Dr. Peter Gray five years ago uh, over in Mount Washington, where our school was very briefly located. Um, and it's with great pleasure and pride that we welcome back Dr. Gray tonight here at Morgan State, uh, right down the road from our new permanent location, which is up in Hamilton, Lauraville. Countless families have found their way to our school through Dr. Gray, whether it be via his book, Free to Learn, or his extensive writing on psychology today. He is currently a research professor of psychology at Boston College and has been writing about democratic education and the importance of autonomy and play in childhood for decades. Dr. Gray is also a founding member of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, or ASDE, a nonprofit organization dedicated to informing people about the benefits of and methods for allowing children and adolescents to direct their own education. We would like to underscore how excited we are to have Dr. Gray with us here tonight and how thankful we are to him for spreading the word about schools like ours. So without further delay, please welcome me in, or please join me in <laughs> welcoming Dr. Peter Gray. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you all for uh, coming out tonight. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I spent a little time visiting the school, visiting the Arts and Ideas School today, and it's just um, really such a relaxed and wonderful place, and the kids seem so happy there. Um, so I am, uh, does everybody have a copy of the handout? Um, if anybody doesn't, maybe raise your hand and somebody will bring it. It looks like everybody's got it. So um, I'm a, an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I'm interested in human nature. I'm interested in how our human nature came about by natural selection. And I'm especially interested in the nature of human children, and most especially in those aspects of children's nature that I'm convinced were shaped by natural selection to serve the function of their education. These are characteristics of all of us humans, but they are particularly acute in childhood. Curiosity, playfulness, sociability. These are the characteristics, as well as a couple of others that I'm going to talk about. These are the characteristics that, in some sense, define childhood. And why is it that children are this way? And I'm absolutely convinced that they are this way because over the course of natural selection, these characteristics serve the function of education. We've been the educative species for as long as we've been human beings, absolutely dependent upon education. Schools are something very, very new, uh, a speck of time compared to evolutionary biology. We did not evolve to be taught. We evolved as children to figure things out, to learn, to pay attention, to control our own education. That's part of the thesis. So my thesis today is that children come into the world biologically designed to take charge of their education, biologically designed for what I'm calling self-directed education. So you've got the handout presents on the front page uh, the outline of my talk, and the back page gives some references. Some of them are my articles, some of them are other people's articles, where if you are interested in the data and extended discussion of the kinds of ideas that I'm talking about here, you can find uh, references to our articles in which you can dig much more deeply than I could present um, in this uh, relatively brief talk. So, A, I'm going to start off, what do I mean by self-directed education? And in order to, to say anything about self-directed education, I have to ask the question, what do we mean by education? So, in our culture, in fact, throughout the world today, the term education is used pretty much as a synonym for schooling. So, somebody asks you, how much education have you had? And what they expect as an answer is how many years of school you've been to, whether you, you finished with high school, or then you went on to college, or then on to graduate school, and so on. That's what education means in most people's minds. 
But certainly from a biological perspective, education can't mean that because schooling is something very, very new. And as I just said, education has been going on for a long, long, long time. So, um, and, edu and that way of thinking about education, education is something that's done to children by adults. It's not something that children do, it's something done to them. The children are passive in this process. An education is given to the child, whether the child wants it or not, and the child accepts this gift, or maybe not accepts it uh, gratefully, but accepts it reluctantly. That's the way we think about education. So I'm gonna be talking about education from quite the opposite point of view, that it's something that the child does actively, eagerly, joyfully, not something that the child begrudgingly accepts from somebody who's giving the education to that person. So I would define, there's a lot of different ways of defining education. To be honest, I define it somewhat different for different audiences. I have a kind of fancy definition when I'm talking to anthropologists about cultural transmission and so on. But I think a very useful definition, a kind of simple one, is simply this. That education is the sum of everything that a person learns that allows that person to live a satisfying and meaningful life. So it's not exactly the same as just learning. It's, you know, any animal can learn, but this education is what you learn, what aspect of what you learn that allows you to live a satisfying and meaningful life as a human being in the culture that you uh, are growing up in, in the culture that, that, uh, that you need to adapt to. So what does this include? This includes those things that human beings have to learn no matter where they're living for a satisfying and meaningful life, or more or less have to learn. I don't say that this is absolute, but more or less, people everywhere have to learn how to walk upright on two legs the way people walk. People have to learn their native language. People have to learn how to get along with other people. We're absolutely dependent on our ability, certainly for a satisfying and meaningful life, to get along with other people, know how to negotiate, know how to compromise, know how to pay attention to other people's needs, and, and to get your needs met while at the same time meeting other people's needs. These are skills that everybody needs to know. Know how to regulate your emotions so you don't drive yourself crazy with fear or anxiety or jealousy. These are skills people have to learn everywhere. People have to um, le um, <clears throat> learn how to make plans and follow through on those plans. People need to learn how to think critically and make good decisions. So these are, asked, these are, these are probably the most important things that people have to learn. And if you think about these things, none of them can be taught. Uh, we don't even pretend that these can be taught. They can only be learned, really, through active participation in the world. So then, in addition to that, there are certain culture-specific things, things that we have to learn in our culture, more or less have to learn, again, I'm, there are certainly exceptions. But in our culture, you know, we're, we live in a literate culture, so certainly valuable to know how to read. Uh, so reading. Uh, we live in a numerate culture, so being able to use numbers and cal do cal the kinds of calculations that are necessary in order to go through kind of our day-to-day -day life is something that in our culture that we, we wouldn't have to learn that in every culture. Um, computers, certainly in this day and age, uh, if there's one skill that is absolutely <laughs> going to be almost essential for everybody, no matter what career they're going in. It's how to use computers. I mean, that is by far the major tool of our culture today. And so learning to use computers. Uh, it might become less important in the even for relatively near future, but for the most part, being able to drive a car is important in our culture. So these are examples of the kinds of things that you have to learn. So, there, so what I'm talking about so far, these are the kinds of common things. These are the kinds of things that if you are growing up in our culture, you more or less have to learn these kinds of things. And then in addition to that, there are those things that make you and me different. 
that uh, each of us to live the satisfying, meaningful and satisfying life that we want to live. There are certain things that we want to know that maybe somebody else doesn't want to know and they don't have to know it. So maybe for one person, knowing everything you can discover about European history is just really key to living your meaningful and satisfying life for what you want to do. And maybe for somebody else, learning everything that there is to know about World of Warcraft is their kind of thing to do, to live the meaningful life that they want to live. This is, this is what makes the world interesting, is that not only do we have these common things that we share that we all kind of have to learn, but we have this, uh, we have all these different things that we want to learn, and that is what makes the whole culture so rich, is that we're not all the same in terms of how we, what a meaningful and, uh, uh, light and satisfying life is to us. And so we each add in different ways to the whole cultural experience because we learn different things. So most of education, as I've just described it, for everyone, no matter how much schooling you had, and even for me, and I had 21 years of schooling, most of my education is not from school. And I think anybody who thinks about it, thinks about what you know, thinks about what it is that you know, especially that's important to you, that sticks with you, that's meaningful to you, and I think you'll agree with me that very, very little of it comes from school. That most of it, no matter how much schooling that we had, comes from our own experiences, our own explorations, our own questioning, our own, our own life in the various ways that we have lived it. So self-directed education is all of that part of education, the great bulk of it for all of us, all of that part of education which comes from the process of our living, our living our life, our pursuing our interests, and are learning along the way. Self-directed education can include organized classes if they're self-chosen. If somebody says, I wanna, you know, I've been fiddling around with the piano and now I wanna take, I wanna be taught by an expert, or I've been monkeying around with, uh, with uh, some higher mathematical ideas on my own and wouldn't it be interesting now, I kinda would like to take a course by somebody who can lay this out in an organized way for me. That's still within the realm of self-directed education, as long as the person is choosing clearly to do it, as long as this person can quit if they want to quit. They're doing it because they want to do it rather than it's imposed on them. Self-directed education necessarily leads different individuals along different paths because well, you know, once we've acquired those basic things, and we continue, of course, to acquire those basic things that all human beings need to learn, then all of, all of what we're learning is, is our own decision of what it is, our own way of making, of way, making meaning in life. So self-directed education can be contrasted to imposed education, and imposed education is really another term for what we normally think of as schooling required, coercive, compulsive, top-down, directive uh, education. Imposed education is aimed at inducing conformity. Imposed education, the whole underlying uh, assumption underlying imposed education is that education is sort of like a race. It's sort of a track. Everybody's going along the same route. And it's a matter of everybody keeping up with everybody else. No child left behind is a good way of phrasing that, as if this is a race and you don't want to fall behind. So that's very different from the way I'm describing education, where it's sort of a bush. There's no way to compare. There's no way to think of it as competition. One person's going out in this branch. Somebody else is going out in that branch. And the only, it doesn't make any sense to say that one person is doing better in their education than somebody else is doing. Uh, so imposed education is aimed at enhancing conformity rather than diversity. And in fact, imposed education, historically, if you look, if you look at it, came about really because of fear of diversity, fear of individuality. And it really, when you look at the literature for the early schools, they were very blunt about it. The primary purpose of imposed education was obedience training. The, the concern was, even in democracies, and maybe especially in democracies, the concern was 
that people really can't be trusted and we have to teach people the right things to think and we have to teach people to obey. We have to teach people that you really don't know very much and that what you need to do is follow the directions of those people who do know and that's basically the, the curriculum of any, um, any uh, course of school. So I want now to turn to B, the educative, on the handout, the educative instinct. So when I say that children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves, what do I mean? I mean that they come with certain instincts, which I'm going to call educative instincts. And it's no mystery, really, what these are. Curiosity. You know, uh, Aristotle, at the, the very first sentence in his great treatise on metaphysics was, the human, human beings are naturally curious about things. Nothing could be truer than that. From the moment a baby is born until often the moment that a person dies, we're exploring the world. We're trying to figure out what's going on around us. Uh, newborn babies, within the hours of their birth, as soon as they can see they, they, if you show them a particular pattern, maybe a kind of checkerboard pattern, and they look at it, and then a few moments later you show them that and something else, they spend more time looking at the new thing than the old thing. They're already fascinated by the new. They're already trying to figure out, okay, I saw that, I kind of got that. Now I'm looking at this, I'm trying to understand this thing over here. They're born, they're, they come out of the womb ready to educate themselves, looking around, figuring things out. And as soon as they can move, they're moving around all over the place to explore everything. Why, why are they getting into everything? They're dropping things to see what happens if you drop it. They're putting things in their mouth to see what they can, how they explore it. And as soon as they can manipulate things with their hands, they're manipulating everything with their hands. What can I do with this thing? They're constantly, constantly doing that. We can't stop them from doing it unless we shut them away in closets. And isn't it interesting that if you think about it, think about if you take a person of any age, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult, and you put that person in a situation where there's nothing new, there's nothing to explore, there's nothing to focus your curiosity on, that would be regarded by anybody as cruel and unusual punishment. What's, isn't that interesting? All your other needs can be met, food, water, anything, you know, bodily comforts, but you deprive somebody of the opportunity to experience new things, to, to be able to learn, and that person has no reason to live, no desire anymore to live. That is, that's the nature, that's how important curiosity is. So, and curiosity does not end when a child reaches four or five years old. Curiosity continues and expands into ever larger areas if we allow it to expand, if we don't quash it. Second characteristics is playfulness. So curiosity and playfulness are sort of complementary instincts. They serve somewhat different functions. They interact with one another. Curiosity is the drive to learn about the world, to gain information about what's out there and what you can do with it and how things work. That's curiosity. It's all about what is there, how does it work, and so on. Playfulness is about skills. Playfulness is about learning how to do things. How can, how can I become good at something? So children play actively in all sorts of ways that were designed by natural selection over the course of human evolution to teach them the basic kinds of skills that are really important for every human being to be able to uh, do in order to live a meaningful and satisfying life. So in, in most cultures, throughout most of human history, it was understood, before we had compulsory schooling, it was understood that childhood is a time for play, that that's what children do. You go into any traditional culture, and, the, and depending on the culture, the children may have chores, but the understanding is that they are playing and exploring most of the time. I'm going to talk about hunter-gatherer cultures in a, in a little bit. 
Our, I have made this claim in front of uh, anthropologists who've studied children worldwide, and so far nobody's contradicted me, and the claim is this. At no time in history, no time in place in the history of humanity, except for times and places of slavery where children were slaves, or times and places of really intense child labor where children were working in factories or mines and so on seven days a week, there has never been a time, when, ch other than those times, when children are less free than our children are today. When children are less free to just go out and play for hours and hours and hours on end. Children are designed to do that. And even in our culture, children were doing that until relatively recent times. Over recent decades, we have taken that away. When I was a kid in the 1950s, we had school. But I was playing out with my friends more hours, many more hours, over the course of a year than I was in school. And that was typical for, uh, for most kids in the 1950s. Since about the 1950s, we've been gradually taking children's freedom away. We are engaged in a uh, cruel experiment to see what happens. And the experiment isn't working out very well because we're beginning to see the high rates of anxiety, depression, even suicide, mental disorders of all sorts that occur when you take children's freedom away, as we as a culture have. So when you look at children who are free to play, and free to play lots of the time, what you find is they play in a lot of different ways. They play in physical ways. They run around, chase one another around. They climb trees. They wrestle. They, engage, they do things that are scary. They climb up trees really high. And they, in our culture, maybe they rollerblade down, uh, or, or, uh, down banisters. They do all kinds of scary things. So what are they doing in this kind of play? Interesting that researchers who study animals, other mammals, say that Essentially, all young mammals play in these ways. They play in vigorous ways, and they play in dangerous ways, ways that they actually sometimes get hurt, occasionally even die, very rarely, but occasionally. Why do they play in these ways? So of course, the vigorous play, this is how bodies are built. This is how children are not designed to lift weights or run around tracks. They're designed to chase one another around, screaming and laughing until their sides are splitting. And that's how they develop strong muscles and good heart and lungs. They're designed to wrestle with one another, and, that, and that's how they develop a, a lot of abilities, some of which I'll talk in a moment. And why do they play in these dangerous ways? You'd think natural selection at least would have weeded that out. The fact that it didn't weed it out means there must be some pretty big advantage to it. And what the animal behaviorists say is that the advantage is actually pretty obvious, and it should be pretty obvious to us what the advantage is to our children. That's how young mammals develop courage. Courage is really, really important because all of us at some points in our life are gonna face real emergencies. And if we don't know how to control our mind and our body in the face of a real emergency, we could lose our life or maybe our child would lose their life because we, we have a panic attack. We don't know how, we're not used to being able, we don't know how to handle fear, we don't know how to handle the emergency. So what young mammals are doing is they're putting themselves in little minor emergencies. <laughs> and then they're discovering they can save themselves from it. I can climb that tree and I can make it down. I can get lost and I can find my way out. I can make this fire and it's dangerous and I can put the fire out. They are doing dangerous things in, in a kind of titrated way that they really kind of know that they can handle. And by doing that, they're acquiring courage. They're acquiring something very, very important. And this is what we're depriving our children of being able to do when we deprive them of all kinds of dangerous play. They play with language. So this is the way what I've just described is the kind of play that we share with all mammals. Now, most of the other remaining kinds of play are more or less uniquely human. We are the animal that talks. Nobody teaches a child to talk. <laughs> Children learn their native language on their own. It's entirely self-directed, and it's learned in play. The earliest cooing and babbling is always playful. Anybody who's had a baby, they're playing with the sounds. They're playing with the syllables of the language. 
And first words are, are almost always used in play. They're never used to ask for anything. They're just used playfully. And as children grow older, they're playing in more and more complex ways they, with language. They become little poets. They, they use alliteration and rhyme and riddles, and they turn the language upside down. I was sitting in uh, the arts and ideas room uh, t trying to read, and there were three little girls. They were probably about five years old behind me. And they were saying, today is opposite day. <laughs> And so they were saying everything the opposite of what they really believed. Now that's kind of cognitive feat and a linguistic feat. And they were so clever at it. They were talking about how much they hate one another and they really love one another. <laughs> you know, one of them wearing a pink dress says, "I hate pink." <laughs> you know, and so they, uh, it was just it was just a nice little example. You can't. Anytime you just listen to children, no matter how young they are, it's just incredible what their linguistic capacities are and how complex their language is when they're playing with one another. There are actually research studies showing that children at play use much more complex language, a richer vocabulary, structurally more complex language than they ever do in the classroom, and they do, and more so when they're talking with other children in the play context than when they're talking to adults. So language development occurs in play, and it occurs much more rapidly when children are playing with one another. So social development, social play, play. No matter how else children are playing, they usually want to play with other children. They're driven to play with other children. Solitary play is nice once in a while. There are times you want to you want to do something artistic. You want to do something that's just you. You don't want to be bothered by anybody else. But the great bulk of play for children throughout the world, throughout history, is social play. Children are drawn to other children. They need other children. And the reason, why is it social play? Why is it so important for children to play with other children? and especially to play with other children away from adults. And the reason is because probably the most important thing that we have to learn as human beings is how to get along with peers, how to negotiate with our peers without some authority figure stepping in and solving the problem, how to deal with minor bullying, how to uh, get our own needs met while still meeting the needs of our playmates. Because if we don't meet the needs of our playmates, they're not going to play with us anymore. And that is sort of the natural consequence, the natural punishment for being kind of a narcissist, for being a bully. And you can't be a narcissist in play and get away with it because the, the other kids are not going to let you act like you're the king of the, of the, of the heap. They're going to uh, insist that, that you recognize their desires and their needs. So in social play, people are learning how to get along with other people as equals without an authority figure stepping in and solving their problems. And this is such an important skill for living a satisfying and meaningful life. You can't have a good marriage if you can't do that. You can't have real friends. You can't have good work partners if you can't do that. We are absolutely dependent on our ability to get along peacefully and well with other people on an equal basis. And uh, that's what children are practicing all the time in social play. We are the animal with opposable thumbs. We're the animal that builds our environment. We build tools, we build shelters, we build means of conveyance, whether they're dugout canoes or carts or whatever it is. We've always done this. And so it's not surprising that children throughout the world who have lots of time to play, among the other ways they play, they play at constructive play, the building of things. What they build depends upon the culture, but children everywhere play at building things. They're learning to use those opposable thumbs. They're learning to use those parts of the brain that are capable of thinking about what it is you're building and translating that into the right movements and manual abilities to be able to build the thing that you have in mind. Children everywhere play games with rules. So uh, I would, if this were a different talk, primarily on play, I would make the argument that all play to some degree involves rules, implicit or explicit rules. That there's always structure in play, there's no such thing as unstructured play, that play is structured by the children themselves. That structure may change very fluidly as you go along. But it, play is never random. Play is something that has a certain order to it. 
But some games, the rules are more obvious. They're explicit rules. In our culture, these tend to be competitive games, whether it's Candyland or chess or hopscotch or baseball or whatever it is. These tend to be competitive games. And the rules seem to serve the function of making, the, making it fair in the sense that everybody has to stay within the same bounds, that the same kinds of moves that are illegal for one person are illegal for the other person and so on. Not all cultures have competitive games, but all cultures have games with rules. So hunter-gatherer cultures, for example, the people who have studied hunter-gatherer cultures say the kids just don't play competitive games. These are not competitive cultures. They play a lot of cooperative games, but many of those cooperative games have very clear, explicit rules about, wh about what moves are legitimate and what are not legitimate. Uh, and I would make the case, so why is it that over the course of natural selection, children evolve this tendency? If there aren't already games with rules, they make up games with rules. Um, why? Well, we human beings in every culture, everywhere, we've got to follow rules. Every culture has rules. And uh, the rules are more or less explicit, but there are some rules that are pretty explicit in every culture. So part of growing up is learning what rules are learning how to create rules, learning the function of rules, and learning to abide by rules, learning to control your behavior in accordance with rules. Because if you violate the rule when you're playing with your playmates and it's a game with rules, they will correct you. They'll tell you, no, you can't do that. That's, not, that's against the law. That's, that's violating a rule. So children are learning that in play. Children everywhere in every culture play imaginative games. They play at, they, they imagine that they're, in our culture, they might imagine that they're superheroes or uh, if they're playing house, that they're mommies or daddies. Uh, in a, in a hunter-gatherer culture, they might imagine that they're great hunters. Uh, they are imagining very often that they're playing a certain kind of role and they are imagining scenes. They're imagining hypothetical possibilities. There's a troll under the bridge. And if there's a troll under the bridge, what does that mean? How do we have to behave if there's a troll under the bridge? And what would be a legitimate uh, thing to do or not a legitimate thing to do if there's a troll under the bridge? They're engaging in what we call hypothetical thinking, the highest form of human thinking is all hypothetical thinking involves imagination. And this is really what distinguishes human thought from that of other animals. We are capable of thinking of things that aren't actually there, which means we're capable of thinking about tomorrow, which, never has, which hasn't happened yet. We're capable of thinking about things that does, don't currently exist, which allows us to become inventors. And we're capable of imagining things like gravity as an explanation. Nobody ever saw gravity. It, for in terms of any uh, empirical existent, uh, experience, it doesn't exist. But we're capable of imagining this and thinking about how it explains a lot of interesting phenomena. And that's what scientists do all the time. And that's what children are constantly doing in imaginative play. They're practicing this kind of scientific thought. And they play with logic. They play, they, even in their fantasy play, they're working out the logic of the play. If this happens, what's the next thing that has to happen? If this is true, what else has to be true? They're playing with logic. And they are playing with the tools of the culture. Children in every culture are drawn like as, as, as if they were magnets to the tools that are that they can see are the tools that are most important for them to master if they're going to do well in that culture. So hunter-gatherer children are drawn to bows and arrows and digging sticks and machetes and fire, and they play with those things, and they become good at those things because they play at those things. Kids growing up in farming cultures are drawn to farming instruments and play at that. Kids who grow up with carpenters as parents and in a carpenting culture play with carpentry tools. Kids in our culture play with computers. Of course they play with computers. No matter what you're going to go on to as an adult in life, the computer, every kid can see that. The computer is by far the most important tool of our culture. And so no surprise, they are drawn to computers like filings to a magnet. And they explore computers, they do creative things with computers, they figure out new ways of using computers, they learn computers much more rapidly than their parents do. 
In every generation, especially in modern times when cultures change pretty rapidly, the young people are always ahead of the older people in terms of embracing the new tools, the new technology, figuring out how to use it, creating the advances in it, and so forth. And we see that right now in uh, the use of tools, um, in the use of computers by our young people. So that's playfulness. Sociability is a third characteristic which serves, it serves many of functions. We can't survive as individuals. We need to be able to cooperate. But so part of sociability is we are sociable because we, way more than any other animal, can learn from one another. And why the main reason we can learn from one another is we have this amazing adaptation called language that links our mind to everybody else's mind. And so I can know not only what I discover, but I can know what you discovered, if I can get you to tell me about it. Or I don't even have to get you to tell me about it. All I have to do is listen and overhear. And kids everywhere, they're not so much asking questions as they are just eavesdropping. They're hearing what adults are talking about. They're hearing what older kids are talking about, and they're absorbing it, and they're thinking about it. They're actively, even if they're not talking themselves, they're listening, they're watching, they're paying attention to other people, and they're learning an enormous amount. I have a, call, a friend who's an anthropologist, who's probably the world's expert on uh, children throughout the world, especially in non-Western cultures. And he says that the primary way that children learn is by watching and listening. Um, it's that they pay attention to what's going on around them. He said the worst watchers and listeners are children in our culture because they get the idea that people are supposed to explicitly explain things to them. And that, and that overwhelms the natural tendency to try to figure things out by watching and listening uh, and uh, paying attention to what people are doing. So that's sociability. We want to know what other people know. And we also kind of want other people to know what we know. We're kind of eager to tell people about what we know. This is a human characteristic that serves the function of education. Then. Um, Fourth, char fourth characteristic, willfulness. Children are not only curious and playful and sociable, but they're willful. So willfulness is sort of the balanced side of sociability. Um, we certainly want to be connected with other people, but we want to be connected with, uh, and we want, to be, we want to please other people and so on, but we also want to be connected with other people on our own terms. We want to play, but we want to play what we want to play to the degree that we can. We're certainly able to compromise in order to play with other people, and I'm glad to do so. But we need to be in charge of our own lives. We need, ultimately, to be in charge of our own lives. And if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, no surprise, if, you know, throughout most of human history, there was a pretty good chance that any adult, any given adult, either of your parents or any other adult, could die any time. And so you couldn't depend on the idea that there's always going to be somebody who's going to be uh, able to uh, solve all your problems for you, that somebody else, and generally speaking throughout history, if somebody else is telling you what to do, they're not telling you what to do for your good. They're telling you what to do for their good. This is simply human nature. This is what led to the democratic principles in the United States. There's no such thing as a benign dictator. And I would argue that even the most loving mother and father is not a totally benign dictator. That even them have their own self-interests in mind very often at a higher level than the child's self-interest. So no wonder that children, by, through natural selection, acquired a strong tendency, beginning maybe around two years old, to say no <laughs> and to resist <laughs> and to say, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. Willfulness is really the drive to take charge of your own life, really the drive to be responsible for yourself. And uh, if we want people to grow up taking charge of their own life and being responsible for their own life, we have to nurture their willfulness. We have to per pre allow them to be willful in order to, in, in, rather than to suppress their willfulness. And the fifth characteristic that I've listed here is uh, 
planfulness, the drive to think about and make plans for the future. And I argue that all children, certainly by the age of at least three uh, or four, are already planning things. When play requires planning, you're making a sandcastle, you're planning ahead, you're thinking about what you're making. I'm making a sandcastle, that's a plan. And then you go ahead and pers pursue that plan. When children are playing, they're always planning. They're practicing planning. They're practicing thinking ahead. They're practicing, they're making an idea. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cross this bridge and I'm gonna escape the troll. And then they go ahead and they do it. They're making a plan and as children get older, their plan, they extend their plans to a little farther in the future. They're maybe playing with their friends today and then they say, okay, tomorrow let's play this. They may or may not follow through on it, but they may. And they're beginning to, they're beginning to think about tomorrow and make a plan for tomorrow. And if children have ample opportunity to make their own plans, they're allowed to make their own plans, become better and better at it. And they begin to make plans for the more and more distant future. And at some point, with our, our culture, they begin to think, well, uh, at some point, I'm going to have to make a living. I'm not going to be able to depend on my parents all the time to support myself. Maybe I need to start making a plan to figure out how I'm going to make a living. And so that planfulness kind of develops over time, but it develops best if you have the opportunity to do a lot of planning. And that requires freedom. That requires the freedom to make plans and pursue those plans it's not going to happen if somebody else is structuring your day for you and telling you what you do from one hour to the next. Interesting research study that was done about three or four years ago at the University of Colorado at Boulder. It was kind of hit the popular press, so maybe you've heard of it. But there's a, there's a um, test that psychologists use uh, called a test of, of what they call self-directed executive functioning which is really a kind of a, a fancy term for being able to plan out a way of solving a certain class of problem. And it's regarded as an important cognitive skill, especially if you're gonna become somebody who's engaged in any kind of creative ventures and in the future, any kind of, um, if you're gonna be a, 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 a business executive or anything like that, where you need to kind of figure out plans, um, uh, figure out ways of solving problems. And, um, and so what these researchers did is they identified something like 106 year olds uh, and they um, interviewed the parents to see how much free time the kids had where they were just creating their own activities as opposed to doing things that the adults were telling them to do. And uh, then they gave them this test of self-directed executive processing and no surprise, those kids who had the most free time, those kids who had the most opportunity to make plans, to do their own things, to structure their own activities were significantly better, quite a bit better, and definitely statistically significantly better at uh, this test of self-directed executive processing than were those children who were living a more adult structured day. So, that's, so those, are, those are the characteristics that I'm saying are the biologic, or at least big part of the biological foundation for self-directed education. These are powerful instinctive drives. They can be trusted. All of us have them, with rare exceptions of somebody who may be born with a very severe kind of brain damage who may need the certain kinds of structuring and uh, that, the, that, most, that the great, great majority of children don't. So now I want to turn uh, C here, I probably have to pick up the pace a little bit here, to uh, self-directed education in hunter-gatherer bands. It, it, uh, it's hard for me to believe that it was this long ago, but it was about something like 15 or 16 years ago that a graduate student of mine and I got interested in education in hunter-gatherer bands. Of course, it's not surprising that somebody who's an evolutionary psychologist would be interested in hunter-gatherers because during the great bulk of human evolution, we were all hunter-gatherers. Agriculture came about a mere 10 or 11,000 years ago, a speck of time in terms of biological evolution. So we all evolved our basic capabilities uh, as hunter-gatherers. Now it turns out that in various isolated parts of the world, there are people who survived as hunter-gatherers relatively unaffected, in some cases almost totally unaffected, by the modern so-called civilized world. 
and they are presumably living the same kind in general hunter-gatherer way of life that they would have been living tens of thousands of years ago before the advent of agriculture. And there are two or three dozen such, there are actually more than that total, but there are two or three dozen such cultures which were identified primarily, the big, the big period for going out and finding these groups and studying them was sort of in the mid 20th century. Uh, from about, especially from about 1950 to about 1980, there were a lot of anthropologists, a lot of cross-cultural psychologists trekking out into the jungles and deserts and so on and making contact with people uh, who had had very little, if any, previous contact with modern societies. And they began to write about it. And I uh, began at some point, about 15 or 20, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, to read what they were writing. And I got interested in children in these cultures. And they didn't write a lot about children, but they wrote a little bit. But what's interesting about these hunter-gatherer cultures, they're also called band cultures. People live in, they, they're not tribes. They're not, they don't have chiefs. They don't have big men. They're bands. They're groups of about... 20 to 50 people, they live in a, in a nomadic way. They don't build permanent buildings. They move around to follow the available game and um, edible vegetation. Um, so they don't own property. There's no sense in owning more than you can easily carry on your back. And they survive largely by sharing. Everything is shared. They share food, and, they, and the anthropologists have great difficulty studying and living with them because the people expect the anthropologists to be regular people who would share everything. Why would they have two shirts when somebody else doesn't have any? So that's, uh, that's their attitude. They really believe in sharing. And part of this egalitarian, in fact, another term for these band hunter gatherers, you see it in the anthropological literature, is egalitarian societies. There have been no other societies discovered who are anywhere near as egalitarian as hunter-gatherer cultures. They don't have chiefs. They don't have big men. They don't have bosses. They don't have followers. They don't, they don't have anything that would be comparable to our notion of employers and employees and so on. Uh, and, uh, and, this, and as part of this egalitarianism, they have enormous respect for individual autonomy. To tell somebody else what to do would be acting like you're a big shot and you know more than that other person and you are in some sense better than that other person. So it really is kind of a taboo in, in apparently all hunter-gatherer cultures that have been studied to be telling other people what to do. You might in some subtle way let them know there's another way to do this. So maybe somebody's chopping with an ax and they're not doing it the right way. You're not going to walk over to them and tell them, hey, here's how to chop with an ax. Instead, maybe kind of subtly you'd go off and do a little chopping yourself uh, with the thought that maybe this person would notice how you're doing it and would improve. So you're, you might be concerned with helping them improve, but you've got to be very careful about how you do it because you don't want to act like you're better than they are on anything. Now, here's the remarkable thing. It was hard for me to believe the first time I heard it. But when I heard it from many different anthropologists, I began to think there must be something to it. This applies to their treatment of children, too. They don't tell children what to do. They simply allow children to do what they want to do and, uh, and uh, trust that the children are going to do the right thing and the children are going to learn and figure out how to do things the right way. So let me read, um, so it, this came out of, I mean, ultimately, because there wasn't a lot written about children, my graduate student and I identified 10 anthropologists who are still alive, still active in many ways, who had actually lived with hunter-gatherer cultures, seven different hunter-gatherer cultures on three different continents. And uh, we surveyed them about what they observed about children and the relationship between children and adults. And also, um, I read whatever I could of the literature that had been found. Now, this, what this study, in terms of what's relevant here, I came to sort of three conclusions from this, um, this look into hunter-gatherer parent-child, adult-child relationships. The first conclusion is what I've just said. Adults do not direct children's activities. And that seemed to be the most startling. Let me just read three quotations that give you an illustration. These are from three different observers of three different hunter-gatherer cultures. So 
Here's what one of them, this person is uh, Yumi Goso, who studied a group in South America called the Paracana, but she's writing here about hunter-gatherers in general. And she says, hunter-gatherers do not give orders to their children. For example, no adult announces bedtime. At night, children remain around adults until they feel tired and fall asleep. Adults do not interfere with their children's lives. They never beat, scold, or behave aggressively with them, physically or verbally, nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. It's interesting, nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. They just assume things are going to be okay. Praise as much as criticism or punishment is a means of control. And praise is sort of the flip side of uh, punishment. You, you really can't have praise without punishment because the withholding of praise, if you've been giving praise, is itself punishment. So they're just simply not in the business of evaluating children, of judging what children are doing. They just simply trust that the children are going to turn out OK. They don't compare. They don't look and say, little Johnny's uh, uh, a year ahead in his uh, hunting uh, uh, abilities, or little Mary just seems to be outstripping all the others in her ability to gather. So they, are, uh, they just don't do that. They just assume that people are, people are individuals that are going to learn ultimately what they need to know to live what I'm defining as a satisfying and meaningful life within their culture. Here's another quotation. The idea that this is my child or your child does not exist. Deciding what another person should do no matter what his age is outside the Yaquana vocabulary of behaviors. There is, no great interest. there is great interest in what everyone does, but no impulse to influence, let alone coerce anyone. And here's a statement I really like. The child's will is his motive force. We went through this long period of history, um, modern history, where willfulness was next to sinfulness, where the job of child raising is to drive the willfulness out of children. And in fact, if you read the literature, the early literature on schooling, that was the explicit purpose of schools, was to drive the willfulness, the devil, in a sense, out of children, and so that they would be subject to uh, authority. And that's how their souls would be saved, among other things. So Appa, isn't that interesting that the idea that in Throughout most of human history, if these, if these people that survived into modern times as hunter gatherers, if they represent the way people were living throughout most time, willfulness was valued in children rather than seen as something to be suppressed. So here's another uh, quotation. One, I'll read one more. Infants and young children are allowed to explore their environments to the limits of their physical capacities and with minimal interference from adults. Thus, if a child picks up a hazardous object, parents generally leave it to explore the dangers on its own. The child is presumed to know what it is doing. I've seen slides of little toddlers playing with machetes, uh, playing with fire, uh, playing with bows and arrows with sharp tips. Uh, Two-year-olds doing this, these kinds of things. And adults sitting back, paying no attention to this. Um, and I asked, I, these slides are shown by a colleague of mine, Gilda Morelli at Boston College, who was kind of the first person I learned about hunter-gatherers from, because she had lived with a group called the F, studied a group for, for quite a long time called the FA in Central Africa. And, and so I asked her, well, don't the children sometimes hurt themselves? You know, these are little children playing with these dangerous things. And she said, yes, they do. <laughs> they cut themselves, they burn themselves sometimes. Almost everybody's got some scars. But what these, what these people understand is the body is an amazing thing. It heals up. <laughs> and um, you don't have to worry that much about it. Uh, the poison darts are kept way up high <laughs> out of the tree. You wouldn't heal up if you poked yourself with a poison dart. So they use a kind of common sense about there are some risks that uh, it's better to let the child take. The child wants to do this. The child is learning how to do this. The child is learning the dangers of it by once in a while injuring himself a little bit with it. And that's how children grow up. And they seem to understand that if you're playing with a tool at age two, you're going to become really good at that tool. That, that if you want that machete or that bow and arrow to become an extension of your own body, the earlier you begin to use it, in some sense, the better. 
So, um, so they would allow the, so there's a lot of reasons why they allow the children to play in these ways. They allow the children to play in these ways, first of all, and primarily because they think it would be morally wrong not to allow the child to do what the child wants to do, unless there's a clear and obvious danger, as there would be if you were playing with something like poison darts. So these are not negligent parents. These are parents who have a different kind of view about what risk means, and in my mind, a more sensible view about risk and what real danger is, and also about the danger of depriving people of the opportunity to take risk, the danger that they're going to grow up not knowing how to handle dangerous things, not knowing how to handle uh, risk, not knowing how to handle getting hurt and overcoming getting hurt and so on. So one of the things that when people hear about all this in our culture, they think children are going to be spoiled. They're just allowed to do whatever they want to do. And this is a recipe for a spoiled child, isn't it? And so uh, here's what Elizabeth Marshall Thomas said about that in a book called The Old Way. Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, at the age of 19, went with her parents who were trekking out into Central Africa to among the first to make contact with a group called the Chawansi. And uh, she was there as part of the team. And uh, she has written two or three books on it. And this is from a fairly recent book. And she wrote, we are sometimes told that children who are treated so kindly become spoiled. But this is because those who hold that opinion have no idea how successful such measures can be. Free from frustration or anxiety, sunny and cooperative, the Juan children were every parent's dream. No culture can ever have raised better, more intelligent, more likable, more confident children. Now, if it were just Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, I would think, so here's a young woman, and she was really enthralled by these children, and she's looking back through rose-colored glasses. But I heard similar comments from essentially all the anthropologists. They talked about how bright the kids were, how friendly they were, how sociable they were, how non-fearful they were, and how non-whiny they were. <laughs> they, <laughs> I mean, here are people who actually, you wouldn't want to be a hunter-gatherer, despite everything I've said, you've got all kinds of bug bites, you've got diseases, you've got, you know, that we, that we today know how to solve. They're, they have all these things. You would think they would be in agony, but they're not complaining about it. They somehow are able, they've mastered the ability to control their emotions, to keep their equanimity, to see the positive in life. And I think a lot of it is because they approach life as play, and that continues on through life. And in play, you can handle a lot. You can handle a lot if you are thinking about life as play. So the second thing that I learned, I asked them, so how much time do the children have? How much free time do they have to play and explore on their own? And what I learned from all 10 anthropologists was essentially all the time. Children from the age of four, which is sort of regarded as the age of having common sense, where you can trust the child isn't going to wander off into the jungle and get eaten by a tiger, um, where the child has sense to, and can keep rules in mind and know how to, to handle themselves from about the age of four on through mid to late teenage years. It's a myth that a teenager is a modern invention. Hunter-gatherers don't think of teenagers as adults, that um, you're, you are still one of the children into your mid to late teens. Um, in part, of course, it's partly because of delayed, um, uh, delayed menarche um, and hunter-gatherers. So you don't really begin, you don't really breach childbearing possibility, typically until you're about 18 or 19 years old. And then once you begin to have your own children, then you're kind of more one of the adults. But up until then, you're out playing and exploring with the children. And even a young adult might be out there a fair amount, even beyond the age of 18. But basically, if you think about it, the kids who are in the age range that are accepted into a Sudbury model school, like this school, age four would be kind of the youngest you would ever take because you, you don't think typically the typical three-year-old is capable of having the kind of common sense to manage themselves as you have to do. Uh, on through mid to late teenage years. And they're playing and exploring in age mixed groups and they're kind of looking out for one another and taking care of one another in that kind of play. 
So they are very, very little work, even if it is expected of them, even of teenagers. Um, and gradually, as they grow older, they gradually take on, still in a play-like way, adult, more and more adult responsibilities. And then the third thing we were interested in is what did they play at? And what we learned is that a lot of their play is at the skills that are essential to success within their culture. So the boys play endlessly at tracking game and at hunting. Uh, terribly difficult skills to learn. It requires a lots and lots of practice. But nobody ever tells the children, go out, you have to go out and practice hunting. They just do it. They do it because they see it's important to their culture. They want to do it. They want to become good at it. And they, they play at this endlessly. They imagine themselves as hunters. They imagine themselves hunting big game when they're actually shooting at butterflies and toads and frogs and so on and so forth. And um, they also play at, at gathering. And some of it is actual real gathering. Also, the, I said that the boys play at hunting and gathering. Uh, in most cultures, it's only the men who hunt, but they're one of the cultures in the group that um, I was, that I was uh, surveying anthropologists about, the Agta in the Philippines. The women also hunt, and no surprise, in that culture, the girls also play endlessly at uh, tracking and hunting. Uh, but, they, but all the kids play at building huts, they play at cooking, they play at making dugout canoes, if it's a culture that uses dugout canoes. They play at the music and art and dance of their culture. They make musical instruments that are modeled after the musical instruments that the adults are using. They, they sing the songs that are traditional of their culture, and they make up their own songs and so on. In other words, they're playing at not just the economically essential skills of the culture, but also the artistically and socially important skills of the culture, and they're becoming good at those things, and gradually the play becomes the real adult thing as they grow older. So what does this have to do with education in our culture? And um, so I'm going to be uh, brief here, but e even before I ever looked into hunter-gatherer cultures, I had done uh, research uh, involving the Sudbury Valley School. The Sudbury Valley School is in Massachusetts. I became acquainted with it a long time ago when my own son became a student there, and that's what really led me to get interested in education and play and so on when my son became a student at the Sudbury Valley School. The Sudbury Valley School is the school that, uh, that Arts and Ideas and many other schools have to, to a large degree modeled themselves after. So. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the Sudbury Valley. It's about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. This is not a new school. This is not a fly-by-night experimental kind of thing. This is a school that's been around for a long time. It's by now got many hundreds of graduates. Um, it's a school, it's a day school, and kids can go there from the age of, um, begin as early as age four. And um, typically they leave uh, in their late teenage years to go on to some other aspect of life. It's uh, called a school, but if you were to go there and you thought it was a school, you would assume that it's always on recess. Um, the kids look like kids like what you would expect kids to be doing if they're doing what they want to do. It's not like they're, sudden, they're free to do when they're sitting there studying algebra books in some formal way or they're practicing writing essays or things like that. They're not doing that. They're, doing, they're playing, they're exploring, they're doing all kinds of things. Sometimes it's even hard to know exactly what they're doing. Sometimes they're sleeping, sometimes they're daydreaming. Uh, the older kids are spending a lot of time just gabbing with one another, just talking with one another as kids do. So that's what they do. And my, here, my son was a student there beginning at age 10. Uh, I didn't have much choice in the matter because he refused to go anyplace else and more or less uh, bullied his mom and me <laughs> into allowing him to go there. And so I uh, was concerned. Uh, I kind of half believed in it, but only half. And uh, I was concerned. I didn't want him living in my basement his whole life. This is the, this is the way of fathers. <laughs> Mothers don't seem to mind it that much. but <laughs> Fathers don't want their kids hanging around. So the um, so I wanted to make sure that he wasn't cutting short his life options by being a student at this school 
where there's no classes, there's no curriculum, there's no, nobody making sure, there's nobody testing him, there's nobody checking out to see if he's learning to read or learning this or that. He's just there being trusted the way those hunter-gatherer kids are being trusted. And um, so uh, in order to uh, decide whether I ought to try to get him out of that school, I um, began to look into the graduates of the school. And ultimately, I did a formal study of the graduates, along with somebody who was a part, that time, at that time a part-time staff member who helped me identify the graduates. This was a long time ago. The school was smaller then, but it had already been in existence for about 13 or 14 years. So there were some graduates who had done all of their, what elsewhere would be their K through 12 schooling there. Uh, and there were about 90 total kids who fell into the category of being graduates in the sense that they were there for at least two years, and most of them much longer than that, and, um, and had gone on to life, not gone on to some other secondary school when they left. And uh, I managed to find almost all of them, something like 90% of them, and they filled out an uh, extensive survey, and then some of them I also interviewed them. And that study absolutely convinced me that I could relax about my son being there. I discovered that these kids were, these young people, these young adults, in some cases they weren't even all that young anymore, were, going, were living very good, very satisfying and meaningful lives. They were happy with their adult life, they were earning a living, they weren't living in their father's basements, they were uh, those who wanted to go to higher education, who had some reason to go to college, didn't seem to have any difficulty going to college, that was eye-opening to me. You know, we think that you've got to, colleges tell you, you've got to take all these required courses and so on. You've got to get a certain grade point average. You've got to so on. Here are kids who did none of that, none of it. They didn't take, not only did they not take, you know, that second language or that uh, algebra course, they didn't take any courses, never took a course, <laughs> never took a test until they took the SAT test if they needed the SAT test. And then they studied for the SAT test. Not too hard to study for. And, and did well enough. And they went on, in some, some cases, to relatively pre quite prestigious colleges. Um, and in other cases, they went maybe to a co uh, community college and then from there to another college. But by no means were, did they have the attitude that college should be the goal. It was only a means. So only those kids who felt that they needed college in order to pursue the kind of career they wanted to pursue went to college. Um, so that, so I found, so there didn't seem to be any limitation, even in terms of higher education, of going, and you know, it's just, isn't it interesting, it's just a myth that education works in this graded kind of way, that you have to learn A before you learn B, before you learn C, before you learn D, before you're capable of then going on and handling what they give you in college. Here's kids who did none of that, and that they didn't seem to have any difficulty handling what was they were being given in college. So um, the, um, the other thing that I observed in that study, it wasn't what I was initially aimed at looking, but something that really stood out to me was I would ask the kids, I would ask each of these people to tell me what they did, what they were interested in when they were students at the school, what they spent their time doing. And then quite separate from that, I asked them about their careers, how, they, how are they making a living. In a very large number of cases, I think probably about 50% of the cases, there was a pretty direct relationship between what they played at and developed passionate interests in as children and what they were now doing as adults to make a living. So just to give you a few examples, one of the uh, young men uh, in the, among the graduates that, um, that, that I studied was uh, the founder and head of a computer software company, um, making a lot of money. He was probably the most wealthy of the graduates. Uh, and he's somebody, he was still in his early 20s. Uh, he didn't go to college. He told me that he had flunked out of public school when he was 13. I don't know if you can actually flunk out of public school, but somehow they were glad to get rid of him. And he uh, came to Sudbury Valley and uh, this was at the time, this was a long time ago, this was at the time when home computers were just becoming popular and Sudbury Valley did not have a computer. Somehow he got interested in computers. And the way Sudbury schools work is they have these special interest groups called corporations. 
And the corporation sort of lobbies with the school meeting to get equipment that's related to their special interests. So he founded the Computer Corporation and got a few other kids to be interested in the Computer Corporation. The school meeting wasn't ready to come up with money for computers. So what he did is he called local computer companies and he uh, presented himself over the phone as, you know, I'm the president of the Computer Corporation at Sudbury Valley. They didn't know they were talking to a 13-year-old kid. And uh, we're very interested in your model computer and would like our, young, our students here to be able to learn to use your type of computer and would you be willing to donate a computer? And he got several computers donated to the school. He's the one who figured out how to use them. He's the one who introduced computers to the Sudbury Valley School. And of course now computers are a huge thing at the school and ultimately is still the case that the staff pretty much learned computers from the kids. So that's, uh, that was one of them. There was another, a young woman who was captain of a cruise ship, the dream job for her. Uh, she, as a girl, was like to play in the pond. There's a pond on the campus. She played with little boats. She got fascinated with boats, different kinds of boats. She took advantage of the off-campus policy of the school when she was a teenager to apprentice herself to a ship captain on Cape Cod. And by the time she graduated, she was pretty well along her way to her dream job of being a ship captain herself. There was another uh, woman who was a, uh, a high, apparently a f rather well-known, for people who know this industry, a well-known designer in the high fashion clothing industry. And she also didn't go to college. She's somebody who, um, as a little girl at the school, played with dolls, as a lot of little girls do. And she got into making doll clothes for her dolls. And then she went from doing that to making her own clothes, and then clothes for friends. And, um, and pretty soon, she became very familiar with patterns and fabrics and so on. And she also apprenticed herself, in this case, to uh, uh, a fashion designer and went on ultimately to her dream job. Um, just to show that not all of, that, there, that at least some of them went to college. Uh, one of them, uh, at the time of the study, was a graduate student in mathematics at MIT. And um, he um, uh, is now a mathematics professor, has been for some time. And so how do you develop an interest in mathematics uh, freely and in play? Well, he described to me that as a kid, he was devouring science fiction. He was just really into science fiction. He would read one science fiction after another. And he developed the idea that a good science fiction is a story where you begin with the real world as it is in the real world, but you change one thing. And uh, then you see what else has to change. If this changes, what else has to change? And you, follow, you pursue that logically. And then at some point, he says he discovered that's pretty much what mathematics is. If this is true, if this axiom is true, then what else has to be true? What else has to be followed? This idea of logical pursuing of uh, if you accept one idea is true, what else has to be true? And he got fascinated even as a child in mathematics and became a rel relatively proficient mathematics as a child. He was also a good pianist and he was debating between whether he wanted to pursue mathematics or piano and ultimately he chose mathematics. Well, those are just a few of the examples. I could, I could give many more. But you know how graduation speakers at typical schools often exhort the young graduates to follow your passions. And it's almost cruel when they do that because where would you discover a passion? How would you develop a passion if all you've done is school? You can't develop a passion in school because as soon as you start to get interested in one thing, the bell rings and then you gotta go on to something else. Even if you do happen to get interested in something that goes on in school. Passions, to develop them, require an investment of time, an immersion in it. It's absolutely destroyed by bells that ring, by schedules that tell you you have to now go from one thing to another. To develop a passion, you need lots of time. You need time to play with different things and discover what you really like to do. You need time to get bored. You need to time to have your soul stirred. You need time to daydream. And you need time, once you're into that passion, you need endless amounts of hours to pursue it, 
to become good at it, and so on and so forth. And you just can't do that if you're spending all your time in school and in other kinds of adult-directed activities. You could sort of do that back when I was a kid because school didn't occupy so much of your time. Uh, you didn't have so much homework, and you didn't have school-like activities outside of school. So people developed hobbies, and sometimes those hobbies became their career, and they became their passions. But we're depriving children today of those opportunities. So now what I want, I want to end with um, talking about, I'm, I've talked longer than I want, I want to leave a little bit of time for, at least a little bit of time for questions and discussion. I want to move to F here, the optimal context for self-directed education. I've listed six characteristics that I believe that these are, this, these are characteristics of a hunter-gatherer band and of a Sudbury model school. I think this is what is shared between a hunter-gatherer band and a Sudbury model school, which makes these good contexts, good places for self-directed education. So, so, I mean, let me be clear. I don't think it's adults' job to educate children, but I do think it's adults' job to provide the conditions that allow children to educate themselves. And uh, in hunter-gatherer culture, that occurs naturally. The band just automatically has those conditions. Our culture doesn't automatically have those conditions. I don't think you can just turn kids out on the street and they're going to become educated in the sense that I'm talking about educated. But I think that if you can provide the same conditions for self-directed education that are present in the hunter-gatherer band, then children in our culture can educate themselves. There's nothing unique about our culture. We do have things that kids need to learn that, they don't, that you don't have to learn in a hunter-gatherer culture, just as they have things they need to learn that we don't have to learn. But it turns out that things like reading and writing and numbers that we have to learn that hunter-gatherer kids don't, it turns out from my observations that children can learn those things in the same natural ways that they can learn anything else. So here are the conditions. The first condition is the social expectation and reality that education is children's responsibility. If we pretend, if we act like it's our responsibility, if we act like if you just do what I'm telling you to do, you will become educated. And if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you won't become educated. If we act as if it's our responsibility, they will give up that responsibility or at least partly give it up. They come into the world believing it's their responsibility. That's why they start educating themselves within hours of their birth. They are driven to educate themselves. And that drive to educate themselves doesn't automatically disappear at school age, but we drive it out of them at school age because we convince them that their own efforts towards educating themselves is a waste of time and that what they need to do to become educated is do what we are telling them to do. So what happens in a, in a, hunt, in a Sudbury school, just like in a hunter-gatherer band, is there's no pretense that the adults are educating the children. They don't call themselves teachers. They don't say they're educators. They don't get, if somebody isn't reading, they don't talk about, oh, Johnny isn't reading yet. And here he is, nine years old and not reading. What can we do to get him reading? They don't do that. They don't do that. When the school was first started, it was kind of hard not to do it. And it's very hard to find good staff members because everybody wants to do that. In our culture, everybody wants to, th everybody thinks we're supposed to educate. It's very hard. It's so ingrained in the culture. But the staff members, they will choose staff members who understand that. It's only the kids. That kid who can't read at age nine, he's going to be reading. Don't worry about it. He's going to be reading. There's never been a student who left Sudbury Valley not able to read, uh, left certainly not as a teenager not able to read. There are kids who've come to the school diagnosed with dyslexia. In that first study I did, there were two kids. Both of them told me they came at age 15 at different times in the history of the school, unable to read passed along from grade to grade with a diagnosis of dyslexia. Both of them said they learned how to read within a few months of being at the school. Uh, so in this context where you're in charge and where you don't have to be embarrassed about not, not knowing how to read and where you can really in comfort teach yourself to read without having to hide behind some kind of label because it's so embarrassing that you can't read, 
in that context, you can learn to read pretty easily. But kids learn it at different stages, at different ages, partly because it's not so much a matter of brain development, it's more a matter of getting interested in it, having a reason to do it. Some kids are interested at age four and they learn to read. Some kids are interest, don't get interested until six, seven, eight. Sometimes the latest I know, except for those dyslexic kids, is uh, 14 who couldn't read. And then by 15, they were just reading fine. So it happens over and over and over again. You can trust them, and it's hard in our culture to do that. Second characteristic, unlimited freedom to play, explore, and pursue your own interests. Not an hour a day or two hours a day. Sometimes when I talk about play to groups of parents, the first question is, how many hours, how much time should I allot for play? You know, that they're kind of expecting me to say, oh, an hour every day or something like that. And, and, um, and so my usual answer is to say, well, you know, if you were to ask a hunter-gatherer parent, they'd say all the time. <laughs> and when, if you were to ask my parent back in the 1950s, they'd say, well, you know, probably at least 30 hours a week, you know, um, probably more than that, outdoors playing. So that's, um, so the, but they really need unlimited time. You need time to dabble with different things. You need time to just do nothing and get bored and, let the boredom stir your soul. You need time, once you find interest, to immerse yourself um, in it. Third characteristic, opportunity to play with the tools of the culture, to play with the real tools of the culture, not just with toys, but with the real tools of the culture. So hunter-gatherer kids play with real bows and arrows and digging sticks and machetes and fire, and they become good at using those tools. And what I mean by play with the tools is to do your own things with the tools. Be creative with those tools, to really make those tools an extension of your own body. And in our culture, there's a lot of different tools. There might be cooking equipment that people get interested in, woodworking equipment maybe, sporting equipment, so on down the line. But of course, the one computer that everybody gets interested, the one tool is the computer, because that clearly is the most important tool of our culture today. And no surprise that children play a lot at computers when they're free to play in our culture. So that's uh, uh, the, f the uh, fourth characteristic, access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. So think about that. First of all, variety of caring adults, not just one adult, as you might have in a classroom, or two adults, as you might have if you've got two parents at home, but a number of adults. Um, it's in, in a hunter-gatherer band, it's basically all the adults in the band. The kids are, can go to any of the adults, and the adults treat them. As, they, they, they really don't differentiate that much between their own kids and anybody else's kids. You're sort of a child of the whole band in a hunter-gatherer culture. At a Sudbury school, there's not as many adults, but there may be five, there may be seven. Uh, and it's important in such, a, in such a school that the adults be different from one another, that they have different personalities, not different outlooks on what education is, but different personalities. And kids are very good at figuring out which adult to go to depending on their needs. So if you need a lap to sit on or a shoulder to cry on, uh, you might go to this adult. But if uh, you definitely wouldn't go to that adult if that's what you need, but you might go to that adult if you wanted to get into a good political argument. So you would. So kids are very good at figuring out which adults and knowing which ones to go to depending upon their needs. They don't have a tremendous need for adults. They're more likely to go to other kids. But, what, but there are times when you need an adult. In addition, the adults are in some sense modeling adulthood, not in a deliberate sense, but just by being there. They're, they're, and, they're, and it's kind of nice to have a number of different models. If, you're, if there's just one teacher and you're just one teacher in the classroom, there's only one adult model and all that person is modeling is being a teacher. You're not getting any sense of what anything else about what it is to be an adult. So, uh, and so that's part of it, having a variety of care and caring adults. These are adults, they're not they, they care about you, they're not judging you, but they care about you. They're cheering for you in some sense. And who are helpers, not judges. How important that is. So I said that hunter-gatherer adults don't evaluate their kids. And 
staff members at Sudbury schools don't evaluate the children. It can be frustrating to parents who might want to know, is my child number one? <laughs> you know, uh, they don't say that. <laughs> you know, they don't have a way of assessing that, and they're not interested in assessing that. So what, one of the things I was sort of impressed with when I got involved with the Sudbury Valley School is how the staff members went out of their way not to ever be in a situation where they're evaluating the kids. So Sudbury Valley, the one case where a situation where evaluation kind of has to occur is in graduation. If somebody wants to give a diploma, many people in the school think the school shouldn't give a diploma because it runs counter to let's, we don't evaluate. And you can't just give a diploma to everybody because then you become a diploma mill and people are just coming to get a diploma and they're not even caring about the school as a real educational institution. So you have to evaluate somehow. And what struck me is the hoops that the uh, staff would go through to be not the evaluators. Anybody else be the evaluators. And they now have a system where they invite staff members from other Sudbury schools to come and do the evaluation. And it's almost like defending a thesis. The kids who have to defend the idea that I'm ready to move on, I'm ready to sort of join the uh, world out there, I've prepared myself uh, well to do that. And so the staff members stay out of it. Why is that so important? It's important because if you think about it, you can't really be honest with somebody who's judging you. You can't really be yourself with somebody who's your judge. You always are to some degree, and while you should be, in impression management mode when you're dealing with somebody. You're not going to, in a situation where the teacher is an evaluator, judging whether you make it to the next grade, whether you whether you get an A or a B, or what, and so on and so forth, you are not going to be wanting to show what you don't know to that person. You're got, not going to be wanting to admit your weaknesses to that person. You're going to want to be showing only your strengths, your good side to that person, and you're not, therefore, being totally honest with that person. And also, the situation of being evaluated automatically is an anxiety-provoking situation. And anxiety, there's lots of research on this, inhibits learning. It inhibits learning, especially any kind of creative learning. That anxiety, that if evaluation anxiety, improves the performance of people who already know how to do it. It helps them show off, but it inhibits the performance of people who don't already know how to do it. And school presumably should be a place where you're learning stuff that you don't already know, and that requires a non-anxiety provoking environment, which means an environment in which you don't feel judged. <clears throat> so that's, uh, then the fifth characteristic is free age mixing among the children uh, and adolescents. One of the worst things we do in our culture is to segregate children by age. Children always played in age mix groups until we developed age segregated schooling. And I've come to the conclusion that age segregated play is unnatural play. I mean, a certain amount of it is fine, but that the bulk of play throughout human history has been age mixed play. Kids were always playing across wide ranges in age. And when children are playing across age, play is quite different from when children are playing just with age mates. It's much more of a learning experience. The younger kids are always being drawn up into higher levels of activity by the older kids. They're being, so, you know, just to take a simple example, if you had only four-year-olds in a, in a preschool, let's say, just four-year-olds, there's no way that you could even have a simple game of catch. <laughs> because no four-year-old can throw the ball straight enough for the other four-year-old to catch it, and no four-year-old can leap and catch the wild throw of the other four-year-old, but put an eight-year-old in the mix. The eight-year-old can toss the ball gently into the hands of the four-year-old, so the four-year-old sometimes catches it. And the eight-year-old can leap and run and catch the wild throw of the four-year-old, and they're both having fun. They're both stretching their abilities. Nobody's making any kind of a sacrifice here. And now the four-year-old has the chance of learning how to play catch. 
The eight-year-old has the chance of learning how to be nice to a four-year-old, learning how to be nurturant, learning how to be a teacher, learning how to be the mature one in a relationship, learning stuff that may be even more important than play and catch, which the four-year-old is learning. And so this is the two sides of age mixing. The younger children are learning skills, they're learning a higher vocabulary, they're modeling themselves after the older kids, they're constantly being drawn up to higher levels of activity. The older kids are learning to be caring, nurturant, leadership. They're learning these extraordinarily important skills. And it's very interesting to me that especially teenagers are really drawn, I've observed this, to young kids. And not surprisingly from an evolutionary point of view. They're about, you know, for evolutionary, they're about reaching the point where they're going to be parents themselves someday. You don't want your own kids to be the first kids you practice any kind of nurturing and parenting on. You want to have some practice. You want to have some experience with little kids. So not surprising. Boys as well as girls, drawn to, drawn to little kids, love to give them piggyback rides and read to them and roughhouse with them and uh, play catch with them and play various kinds of games with them and so on. And it's not just that the young kids are modeling the older kids. There's a certain sense in which the older kids are modeling the younger kids in a valuable sense. So younger in our culture, it's sort of not cool beyond a certain age to be doing all these kind of creative things like playing with blocks and clay and crayons and so on that little kids do, playing with building with Legos and these kinds of things. Uh, but if you are a teenager and there's a lot of little kids around doing that, that's a stimulus to do it. <laughs> and maybe you've got the excuse you're doing it with the little kid, but maybe you're not even doing it with the little kid. You're just doing it parallel. This stuff is around. It's not surprising to me that a lot of the graduates of Sudbury schools go on to highly creative careers, and I think it's partly because they continue these kinds of creative activities and become good at them beyond the age at which uh, most kids in our culture think that's childish and are not doing it anymore. So age mixing is a real key. A Sudbury model school absolutely would not work if we're age segregated. The, the, the education absolutely depends upon the fact that the older kids are pulling the younger kids up. The older kids are also helping to take care of the younger kids, not because they have any responsibility to do it, because they just naturally do it. They want to do it. They love the younger kids. And that's one of the reasons why Sudbury Model Schools don't cost as much as other private schools. You don't need a lot of staff because the kids are kind of looking out for one another. They're sort of taking care of one another. Um, uh, they're not just learning from one another, but they're also taking physical care, ensuring the safety of one another in various ways. And then the six characteristics, I used to talk about just these five characteristics, but I've decided the six characteristic is really important. Immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. I'm not absolutely certain it has to be a democratic community in the literal sense that we think of as, demo as democratic, democratic procedures but certainly a stable, moral, caring community in a community in which the children's voices are meaningful and are heard and are significant and play a role in what happens in that community. And that's true in a hunter-gatherer culture and it's true at a Sudbury, in somewhat different ways, at a Sudbury model school. So what happens when you are, when you are in a community and you're growing up in this community is you develop a sense of responsibility not just for yourself, but a sense of responsibility for the community too. You are, educate, you are educating yourself not just for yourself, but you're educating yourself to be a valuable member of a community. You care about this community. If it's a hunter-gatherer band, you care about them. And these are people you're going to be with a long time. If you're in a Sudbury school, you're not going to be there forever, but you'll be there a long time. You might be there for... Uh, you know, as, as, as much as 10 years or more, 12 years. This is your community, and you begin, the more time you're in it, and the more familiar you are with the people in it, and the more you have a sense that you're making the rules here, that this community depends upon you, the more you have a sense of responsibility. One of the things I learned in the study of the graduates of Sudbury Valley is a lot of them were very, very much civically active. They were active in their community. They cared whether their local community or their more national community. And many of them attributed that caring to the fact that they were very involved in the community of the Sudbury Valley School growing up. And they developed this sense that it's part of a person's responsibility 
to not just look out for yourself, but to look out for the community that you're part of. So I am going to quit at this point. I've talked a little bit longer than I should have. Um, and thank you very, very much for your kind attention. <clears throat> So I guess we have, I should say that anybody who has to go don't feel uh, embarrassed about <laughs> having to go. <laughs> We're a pretty non-judgmental bunch here, <laughs> as, as Peter has explained. Um, so we are going to open the floor for some q and I'll come around um, with a mic, and, and um, if you have a question <coughs> for Dr. Gray, we also have some um, snacks and refreshments out in the lobby, so um, feel free to kind of mingle with us a little bit afterwards. Uh, certainly, if you're curious about our school, feel free to find one of the staff members, parents, or students of Arts and Ideas. Uh, many of us are here. We've got buttons on and our t-shirts on, so feel free to find anyone with a button um, and ask questions afterwards. Um, but for right now, does anyone um, want to start off with a question for Dr. Gray? Right. Great. Thank you. Um, I hope I can formulate this all right. Uh, you convinced me of the validity of of what you were talking about, but there was one area that uh, barely got mentioned, and that is reading. And I, in reading, I mean books. They don't have to be dead trees. It could be, you know, some other form. Sure. But reading a book, literature, not to acquire information necessary for the child's profession, right. but just to read because I'm convinced that that's a vital path to right. higher yeah. intellectual capacity. Yeah. Because it is done, it's perhaps the only activity that's done at the person's own pace. You stop, you read a few lines, then you stop, you think about what you read, you take it someplace else perhaps, yeah. and so on and so forth. I don't see that happening on a computer unless you're reading a work, you know, a book on a computer it could be the same, but it's that um, self-pacing is that makes a reading. part yeah. of what makes it so yeah. important for the development. Yeah. Well, you know, I could talk all day on reading. In fact, I do give talks this exactly on reading. Let me, you know, there's a number of things you said that I want to comment on. Isn't it interesting how much we value reading in our culture today? When the printing press first came out and novels first became available, the older generation was frightened of them. This was the new evil. <laughs> this was going to destroy the minds of the young. <laughs> it was going to especially rot the minds of people. Nobody would have to remember anything anymore. It's all written down. And moreover, some of these novels are going to have salacious material in them. And women are going to grow up without moral standards. There were people who were railing the older generation. Every time there's a new technology, the older generation says this is going to be the ruination of the young younger generation. And then the younger generation acquires that technology, and now this is the savior. <laughs> this, is the, this is the wonderful thing, and it's the new thing, that damn computer, those screens. This is the ruination of that. This happens over and over and again. It's been happening since, since humanity. It happens at a faster pace now because technology changes. Secondly, in terms of reading, learning to read, it's interesting to me that uh, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, I haven't done a formal study, but my studies of grown unschoolers who are like Sudbury model people that are doing it in a homeschool context, um, but they're self-directed, and my studies of the graduates of Sudbury School and my more informal studies of other graduates of other Sudbury model schools is they do a lot more reading than most kids do in our culture. And the reason they do a lot more reading is they've never been forced to read. Reading is not a chore for them. So no matter when they learn to read, they've learned to read because they like to read. So many, I've, I've done studies of how kids have learned to read. So uh, a, a few years ago when I did this study, it was when the, when the um, Harry Potter books were really popular. And there were kids who couldn't read, and the very first book they read was a Harry Potter book. <laughs> and some of them would describe, my mom would read it to me, but then she'd get tired, and I needed to hear the rest of it. 
And so I sat there and I figured out how to read because I had to find out what was going to happen to Harry Potter. I heard that story over and over again in different kinds of contexts. And as I told, I told you about the kids who have gone to public school who couldn't learn to read, given a diagnosis, they came to Sudbury Valley, they learned to read. There's no problem with reading at Sudbury Valley. But let me also say, in terms of this idea that reading is somehow more valuable than using the computer, I don't think that's true. First of all, the computer is far more, there's far more things you can do with that computer. You can read, you can just use it like a book, and you can read it at whatever pace you want. I do most of my reading, I used to, it took me a long time, I'm an old guy, it took me a long time to want to do my reading on a computer, but now I find it's a value to do a read on the, first of all, I can I can increase the size of the print to whatever size I want. <laughs> I can, if I forget what those initials meant, I don't have to turn the pages. I can do a search and I get right back to it. It really improves. It makes me a more active reader. I don't know where this country is that they are located on. I switch on a map. Oh, there it is. I'm really interacting with that book in a way that if I were reading on the printed page, I would not be. I'm a much more active person. I'm part of the story in a certain sense when I'm on that. And the other, the, when people, people are so afraid of screens and there's so many myths about them, and yet all the studies, when I actually go to look at the research, the research doesn't bear out those myths, and it very often bears out the opposite. You know, so one of the myths is the kids who are on screens a lot have fewer friends, they're less sociable. The only research that's ever looked at that found the opposite. <laughs> they have more friends. This is how kids communicate these days. They, get, they, they talk in person about the computer. They get together when they're together physically. They talk about the computer. They're playing. I was at this arts and ideas school today, and in the computer room, boy, those kids were not socially isolated at the computer. They were dancing around the computer, talking about what they're doing, doing it together. Um, there's no evidence that all in all, you can find case histories to prove whatever you want, you know. But when you look at it statistically overall, the, the myths just don't bear themselves out, these fears that we have of the computer. And in fact, I would recommend, I, I wrote a blog post on it a couple of years ago, but that my blog post was based on a larger uh, review article that uh, researchers who have been studying the cognitive effects of computer play had written a number of researchers, and it summarized many dozens of carefully controlled studies which show the, op the people, you, you can actually read people who believe and say in the magazines and newspapers that the computer somehow dulls your mind. The exact opposite has been shown. I don't know if you think IQ is important or not. I have mixed feelings about IQ. But it has been proven over and over again that there's no activity that raises IQ more than computer games do. Uh, there's simply the kind of cognitive stimulation that occurs from computer games is unmatched in terms of its effect on those kinds of abilities that go into IQ tests. The first such study was done a number of years ago. Uh, and there's one IQ test. It's the, only, well, it's the only IQ test that males do better on average than females do. And it's a spatial arrangement kind of thing where you have to imagine what would it look like if you turned, if you twisted in three-dimensional space this object, which one would it match, and so on. And, and males do better on that than females. And so, somebody, and so there are actually theories that this has to do with basic innate brain, and, you know, hunters had to learn to spatial organization and gatherers didn't was kind of the idea. And so somebody challenged that and they said, well, you know, boys growing up do a lot of different things. And today, one of the things they do is they play a lot of shoot 'em up uh, computer games. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's do an experiment where we take some college women uh, and we, we, as part of the experiment, they have to play these shoot 'em up computer games a <laughs> certain number of hours a week. And the control women who, uh, none of these were computer game players before, the control women are doing some control tasks. And lo and behold, they found that the ability to do those spatial organization IQ tests improved to the same level as, on average, for males, those who were in the control condition didn't improve. Even months later, without continuing to play the games, they were still had this extra ability. Since then, there have been many comparable studies and dozens of studies. 
Uh, the conclusion is there's not, never been anything found that raises IQ more than computer play. Some of the early studies, that oh, they did this simple thing. They just simply gave uh, kids IQ tests, and they also asked them how much time they spend on the computer. And what they found is those kids who spend a lot of time on playing computer games have higher, higher IQs than those who don't. And so then the question is, is it just that smart kids are drawn to computer games and, and less smart kids aren't? So then they did the, this kind of study that I've just described in many different kinds of versions with different kinds of cognitive tests. Take kids who don't play computer games, have some of them play a computer game for a period of time, some not, and lo and behold, the score on the IQ test goes up. I've become convinced, I'm not a computer game player, but I've become convinced that as I grow older, I should start playing computer games. <laughs> and in fact, there are, in the fact, there are really, uh, in many senior centers, their encouragement of playing computer games to preserve your memory, to prevent senility, and so on and so forth. So I, um, I, you know, I, I, I tend to get on a soapbox about this because this is something that the culture has simply um, carried away, and there's a lot of pseudoscience out there, and if you really look at the science, the real studies, they simply don't bear out all these scare headlines that you read about the harmful effects of so-called screen time. <clears throat> Great. Okay, I'm going to walk around this. <laughs> if you want, you can speak to some kids who have unlimited screen time tonight. <laughs> See how they are. The other thing that's interesting that I discovered, you know these, you read the data about how, many, how much time kids are spending on screens, and so someplace I had read that the average teenager is spending, I forget what it was, eight hours a day on screens, and so I thought, now I don't know if that's bad or good, but I thought, where, where did they get that number from? And I'd heard that, I'd seen that quote at a number of different places. It does sound like a lot of time on screens, if, if nothing else, especially if you're going to school, and you're in school for about eight hours, and then you've got eight hours of that, you're not having much time to sleep and do anything else. So I thought, where, where are they getting that data from? And it turned out when I looked, I finally tracked down the study, which is the original study that was quoted. And you know what they did? You know how some kids have multiple screens on at the same time, right? <laughs> so they've got their little iPhone, and then they've got their computer on, and then there's a television on in the background. One hour of that counts as three hours of screen time. <laughs> That's how they got this absurd number of eight hours a day. And yet this gets quoted and passed along, and oh, how horrid, <laughs> you know? That, so, you know. Um, hi, first, thank you for being here. It's really, um, it feels reassuring to hear you speak. <laughs> um, I am a mostly unschooling mom of three. And the reason it's mostly unschooling is because I feel like my ability and my family's ability to do this is because we come from a place of privilege. And I feel like um, I agree with everything you say and I have a desire to give my children the opportunity for the type of education that you speak of, but I also feel this nagging what if, what if they have to return to normal society for one reason or another, and that makes me feel like I have a responsibility to also prepare them for, you know, if you know, I have a seven-year-old who can't read or write or anything, which I think is completely fine in our environment, but if something happens next year and he has to be in a school setting, I feel like that would just be jarring and shocking. And so I don't know how to balance that belief right. that this is right and desire to provide this along with the responsibility to get with the program with the outside world. Right. Yeah. Um I honestly think you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and the reason I think about if one of the studies that, uh, not a study that I did, but a study that was done, another study later on, and there's a whole book on this study, done at the Sudbury Valley School, they looked not just at the graduates, but they looked at kids who, for one reason or another, left Sudbury Valley and then went to a regular school at various ages. And the question being looked at is, did they have any difficulty adapting to the regular school? And the result, just like I found they didn't have any particular difficulty adapting to college, it turns out they don't have any particular di difficulty adapting to the regular school either. So the kid who can't read because he's had no reason to read, ah, suddenly I'm in this situation, oh, I better learn how to read. <laughs> Everybody has to read here. And they learn how to read very quickly. Um, 
you know, th it, it is amazing when kids need to do it and they recognize they need to do it in order to fit in with their peers and so on, they can learn this stuff really, really easy. You know, I first kind of recognized this. I moved around a lot as a kid and I remember in high school moving to a school that uh, only taught French one, one year, and then the next year they taught French two. And I came at the French two year and I'd never taught, taken French one. And I believed, falsely as it turns out, that, that colleges were serious when they said you had to have two years of a language if you wanted to go to college. So I enrolled in French two and I'd never taken French one. And I'm no good at languages, but in about a week I was able to catch up. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is that kids don't learn a lot in those classes. And the things that, things like reading that we worry about because we think they're so hard to learn, when kids really want to learn them, they're not hard to learn. The, the, I've, read, I've written several articles on reading, and one of, one of the things I'm really fascinated by about learning to read is we've always known that there are a certain number of kids who can read by the time they're three. How hard can reading be <laughs> if you can read by the time of three? My son was one of them. You know, he's a bright kid, but he's not a genius. He's not a genius. And I don't know how he learned to read, but he was in an environment where I was a graduate student reading all the time. You know, he probably looked around. He said, well, this is what people do, right? They read. <laughs> so he figured out, you know, and he actually would ask for, you know, we'd, he'd be, we were still carrying him around in the backpack. And he'd say, what's, what's that say? And I'd say, exit. <laughs> or what's, this, what's that say? And he would, and he would ask. And he would, and by... At some point, we discovered he could read. Well, the first point, the first time I realized that he could read very clearly, we were visiting, um, we were visiting a New England village. We were, I was a graduate student in New York. We were up visiting a New England village, and in the town square, there was this monument uh, to those who fought and died. To uh, so, my son went up, and and he. He looked at the monument and he came back to me and he said, why would somebody fight and die to save an onion? <laughs> so he was reading phonetically. <laughs> I didn't know he knew phonics. <laughs> you know, reading is not hard. We make it hard in school. We make it hard by forcing kids to do it when they're not interested in doing it by forcing them to do it in a situation in which they're anxious about it, that we're teaching them to read in the worst possible situation, the worst context for them to learn something like that. And in school, of course, it is important that you learn how to read on schedule because everything else depends upon reading. So you are going to be behind if by six or seven you can't read. And you may end up being hopelessly behind. You may end up, in fact, there are studies that show for kids who go to regular school, this was actually a study done in Sweden, but I think the same thing applies here. For kids who go to regular school, if you're a slow le reader, you're likely to become a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> Why is that? I think it's because if you're a slow reader, you get identified as one of the bad kids. <laughs> you're not doing what you're supposed to do in school. You kind of identify as a way of becoming, especially if you're a boy, a way of a way of exerting yourself, you become one of the bad kids and then and you get into trouble. But there's no indication that reading late, if you're at a Sudbury school or if you're doing unschooling, has any disadvantage at all. I did a survey of learning to read. It was primarily unschoolers, but there were some people from Sudbury model schools. So I wanted to, I wanted, this was sort of a survey of parents. When did your child learn to read? What do you know about why your child learned to read? How they learned to read and so on. And interestingly, I got many stories of this sort. I've got three children. One of them learned how to read at age four. Another learned how to read at age six. And so-and-so didn't learn how to read until she was 13 years old. And by 14 years old, she was writing novels. You know, it was, uh, you know that's a slight exaggeration, but not too much. That thy, and and all, all of them would say, you know, by a certain age, you, couldn't, you wouldn't be able to know which one was the early reader and which one was the later reader. I don't think it has to do with differences in the brain. It has to do with differences in when you get engaged with it, when you feel a real desire and a need to do it. And in our culture, everybody at some point is going to feel that. If you want to speak to one of our students about that, look for the pins that say, it's not that hard. <laughs> um, I think we're going to do one more brief question. We'll go over here to Chris, and then we'll give Dr. Gray a break. 
Um, thanks. This is been very interesting. I wanted to get your perspective on kids who have spent most of their time in a regular public school. Um, and then is there any benefit to them switching at maybe age 15 in ninth grade, just off the top of my head with that age? Um, <laughs> just to take a random age, right? Yeah. Um, or is it, you know, are they already sort of indoctrinated and it's too late? I, I think that... Um, that there, I, I think a lot of kids come around age 15 at Sudbury Valley. And um, it used to be that kids would come even later than that, but they've sort of changed the rules there. You have to be a student there for at least three years if you want to get a diploma from the school. And the reason they did that is because they were getting a certain number of students who were coming only as a sort of last resort way of getting a high school diploma. And, and those kids were not adding in a beneficial way to the environment of the school in the judgment of the people at the school. So they wanted people who would take the school seriously. They didn't want people who were going to just come for one, for their last year of high school or their last two years of high school. But still, age 15 is within that. So kids are still coming at age 15. And, you know, like those two kids that I described that were just couldn't read, they came at age 15 and they learned how to read, you know, and they went on. Both of them went on to college with no learning disability. One went on to, to nursing school and one in, went on to a liberal arts college. Uh, no learning disability, you know. So I, I think that there's, I think, it, I think that really any age that you come is fine. I think that there is sometimes a difference that, uh, I don't know if it's still true today, but at the time when I was spending more time at Sudbury Valley School and was more aware of what was going on, there would always be a certain number of kids who seemed just really bored and uh, disenchanted and they were just sort of sit there talking about how bored they were. Uh, or they might be sitting and listening to music but not doing anything else and it would take a long time. And kind of uh, what I learned is that they're sort of going through what people call a de-schooling process. They're overcoming, you know, they're, they're, they're going through a phase of just needing to chill out. <laughs> uh, they're not ready to declare an interest and they also don't quite trust what's happening here and they're still feeling kind of cynical. And um, this used to be called, actually Sudbury Valley, this is going back quite a long way, it still had a smoking room. This used to be called the smoking room crowd. They'd sit there and smoke. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then finally they did away with the smoking room, but there was still that crowd that would sit and you know, maybe try to sneak off and smoke something else if they could. <laughs> but other kids would find them and tell them they can't do that. So, but at any rate, that can happen, and the, the, by no means happens to all of them, but it's, if there are certain times, there are a certain number of kids who come in and they're just burned out, and they act like they're burned out for a while. But I think, here's another thing about age mixing. It's hard to spend a lot of time being cynical and burned out when there's a bunch of little kids <laughs> who want to give you a piggyback, who want them to, you to give them a piggyback ride, or want you to read a book to them, and they're happy, and they're, they somehow bring you out, you know? It's kind of hard to sit there and be a cynical teenager when uh, all this happy little kids are. So I was sitting there today trying to uh, rest be, before this talk, and there were three little kids, those same little kids that I was talking about had, uh, uh, they were also climbing on my back, and they were, they were trying to draw me out, <laughs> you know, I had this boring old person just sitting there, why, why, <laughs> you know, and so I could just imagine if I were a teenager, it would be very, very hard to resist those beautiful little girls who were trying to get me to play with them, <laughs> so... Yeah. Okay. Great. So I think we're going to finish up in here. Like I said, we've got a little reception outside, and so feel free to um, chat with one of us or with Dr. Gray. And I'd like to thank him one more time for coming tonight. Thank you.